This is InfoSec Decoded number 64 to copy your brain. And Alan is starting with the cryptocurrency expert helping North Korea. Yes, uh, crypto, so-called cryptocurrency expert Virgil Griffiths has uh, pleaded guilty in US federal court in New York to uh, one count of violating what is the law called? Um, the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, uh, conspiracy to violate the International Emergency Economic Powers Act. And you'd think one count doesn't sound so bad, but this is a really, really big deal, this one count, because uh, he's now liable for up to 20 years in prison. Uh, thanks to this guilty plea. A lot of this coverage has been very definitive in its presentation of the facts, um, more or less following what the US federal prosecutors have alleged in the case, <laughs> namely that uh, Griffiths um, aided uh, North Korea substantially and that uh, he um, compromised American and international security by doing so, that um, uh, North Korea was aided materially, and that uh, he helped North Korea circumvent sanctions. Um, uh, just to quote something from the Justice Department statement, um, at this cryptocurrency conference at which Griffiths attended and from which all this hullabaloo uh, developed, um, the uh, Justi Justice Department said that uh, Griffiths and his co-conspirators provided instruction on how the DPRK could use blockchain and cryptocurrency technology to launder money and evade sanctions all of which happened in August of 2019. Well, it sounds very cut and dried, but if you actually look at the complaint that um, was filed in support of this, um, this complaint was uh, filed in an affidavit by one of the FBI agents who participated in interrogating Griffiths, um, the circumstances sound start to sound a great deal flimsier and the case a lot less substantial than uh, what one would think. And so if you look at the documentation, this FBI agent says essentially that uh, Griffiths confirmed to him, the agent, that Griffiths did indeed attend this conference and that at this conference, some DPRK officials asked him questions um, about proof of work that he communicated, Griffiths communicated in advance with DPRK officials, as a matter of fact, and that uh, they approved his talk the, and the topic of his talk. And also, by the way, that Griffiths had um, attempted to get permission from the U.S. State Department to attend this conference in the first place, and that the State Department said, no, uh, we're not going to give you approval to attend this conference because it's likely going to be in violation of this uh, of the sanctions. Mm -hmm. But Griffiths went ahead and attended this event anyway, so he got in, in trouble for that. Mm. Um, as for the transferring of some, uh, uh, transferring of, of cryptocurrency, he uh, apparently transferred one coin. It doesn't say which cryptocurrency, but probably mm. Ethereum. Yeah. Since Griffiths is um, part of the Ethereum group. And so he transferred one uh, Ether. What I don't know if the, the, the coin is called Ether, one Ether. Well, it is, although the way it's stated here, it doesn't state the amount. It's cryptocurrency type one, which is- Yes, well, if you look at the affidavit, yeah. it says that uh, Griffiths tra transferred just one ether from mm -hmm. South Korea to North Korea. Yeah. Uh, and that's pretty much all the substance of this. 
other than Griffiths also expressed an interest in changing his uh, citizenship, renouncing his U.S. citizenship and becoming a citizen of a different country. Ah, uh, and so that's maybe that's whole, what he should have done, actually. Yeah, that's right. He should have done that a little bit sooner and maybe he'd be OK. He could hang out with, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, somebody in uh, somebody famous in Russia, for example. Or he could he could be partying in North Korea. The, the yeah, hospital. he could just move to, to North Korea. So anyway, you read the news accounts and it sounds like he did a terrible thing in aiding North Korea. You know, like he was actually involved in monitoring <clears throat> or that he um, gave them inside knowledge on how to, uh, you know, do Bitcoin mining or help them evade sanctions. And, and really, it doesn't amount to much of anything at all. And it really sounds more like a case of uh, federal prosecutor, accuser, uh, prosecutor careerism and ambition, wanting to rack up a conviction just so yeah. that they can, you know, polish their resume a little bit. Well, you know, I'm glad you put that perspective on it, because when I first heard it, I thought the same thing. Here he is helping North Korea. What a bum. But then it reminds me when I went to China, I, they said, we need another talk in the blue team section, DEF CON China. I said, oh, I could teach cryptography. They said, oh, no, if you teach cryptography in China, when you come back to America, everybody will get mad at you. And I said, oh, gee, my cryptography is innocent, harmless stuff. Nobody would care. And they said, oh, don't do that. Now, I'm glad they did that because, <laughs> you know, it's not like this isn't public knowledge. Everybody knows how cryptocurrency works. I mean, right, exactly. And in this affidavit, it actually says that Griffith states that uh, this is common knowledge. Yeah. And that this knowledge could have been gained from just a cursory search of the internet. And I'm sure, and besides, I, from what I've been reading, North Korea has been entirely funding their, uh, their entire country by stealing from cryptocurrency services for the last five or 10 years. Right. So they know very well how it works and what to do with it. Yeah, they're uh, in <laughs> cryptocurrency over there. So he didn't actually materially help our enemies do anything. Not at all. Not at all. But according to this affidavit and the way it's presented, yeah, then of course it can be interpreted as um, uh, as materially assisting North Korea. But when you actually examine the circumstances, it doesn't seem to be the case at all. Not one bit. So yeah. it really, again, it, it comes down to, well, how zealous are the prosecutors and uh you yeah. know everybody everybody's breaking the law in one form or another at all times pretty much so it just depends on whether you get caught and if the prosecutors want to actually pursue the case and unfortunately for griffiths in this case it seems that the prosecutor very much wanted to pursue the case well you know another argument that i hear which does make some sense is that you should just get rid of cryptocurrency entirely the way china did because pretty much the entire reason it exists is to commit money laundering. <laughs> and, and you could totally argue that. And a lot of people are saying that would be the way to get rid of ransomware. And I, I'm not 100% on board with that, but there's logic there. That there, there certainly is. And who knows how many people are using cryptocurrency to circumvent taxes or all of them. money laundering. Or... Why would anybody use it for any other yeah. reason? That's what they're all doing with it. Right, right. So... In the grand scheme of things, going to North Korea and giving a talk in yeah. which you present basically common knowledge ideas really seems like the most minor of offenses. And yet Griffiths is looking at a 20 year sentence. This is now, why I need a lawyer. Like I it, said, I was going to do the same thing in China. Yeah. I, oh, no, that'll be bad. I said, oh, no, nobody would go into this. And this is the second part, really, of this horrible situation, is that Griffiths apparently sat down for two meetings with FBI agents, uh, once in New York, once in San Francisco, and he consented to a forensic search of his cell phone. And Well, um, that tells me right there he doesn't have a good lawyer. Yeah, he either didn't have a lawyer at all, or he had a horrible lawyer. Yeah. Because uh, he didn't have to do all that, I don't think. You know... You don't go talk to an FBI agent to maintain your best interest. What you need is a lawyer. Yeah. And uh, he basically self-incriminated his way right into this, uh, this charge. And, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. This reminds me of the, uh, 
the Secret Service meeting I went to where they had this defense lawyer. He said, guys will call me. And they say, the cops pulled me over and they asked to search my car. And first they asked, do I have guns or drugs in the car? And I did have those things in the car. Then he said, can I search the car? And I said, yes. And then he searched the car. So now I'm calling you. And the lawyer's like, well, what am I going to do for you now? You say, no, you call me before you say stupid things. Now, what am I going to do? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. Uh, but on a, on a personal note, I actually have met Virgil Griffiths a couple of times. Really? Yes. He's no friend of mine, but he's a friend of a friend. And so I have talked to him uh, about cryptocurrency and North Korea. Oh and this goes goodness. back like over a decade. Actually, the first time I met him, this was shortly after he got his PhD from Caltech. And I, I remember very clearly having a conversation with him about this, saying that he really wanted to go to North Korea, that he was very interested in the uh, mass psychology of a uh, personality cult and a government run on a personality cult. It must be horrible to live in a nation with that kind of awful thing going on. We wouldn't know anything about <laughs> yes. that. Yes. Okay. Yes. And, you know, with, with any foresight, I could have told him, well, you don't have to go to North Korea to learn what it's like to live in a nation ruled by personality cult. You can stay right here yeah. in America. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, he could choose one or the other, but mixing the two in this fashion did not turn out to be a wise move. That, that's exactly right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he had been living in Singapore for a number of years. So yeah. I, I think maybe he was just a little too far removed from all of this. And, yeah. Well, anyway, all, all jokes aside, um, he, he actually did have a sincere interest in, in understanding uh, the psychology and society of North Korea. And I think this is purely speculation on my part. I have not communicated with him in several years, but it, I, I would think that he probably treated this as an opportunity to get inside of North Korea, first of all, which is very hard to do as an American citizen. And second, uh, that this was an opportunity to get a sense of the workings mm -hmm. of North Korean society and the government, which yeah. was a longstanding interest of his. And unfortunately, it was his curiosity that did him in. Like so many of these cases, it's a shame if he only had a good lawyer. Yeah, exactly. You could, you could make an argument that made this sound a lot better if you had somebody like a lawyer to help you. Yeah, yeah. And, and he should have known better, too, because he was friends with Aaron Swartz. Yep, which was the same deal. I mean, yeah. if either of these guys had talked to a lawyer earlier, they could have saved themselves a lot of pain. Yes, Yes, indeed. Yeah. All right. Well, I've got more cheerful news. So the uh, um, they measured the life expectancy loss due to COVID-19, and the United States is number one. We lost like two years of average life expectancy. There's a really great bar chart here showing all the nations how many years they lost. And the United States is number one. The men lost more than two years, and the women lost more than 1.5 years off their life expectancy entirely due to COVID. And no other nation lost that much. So, uh, and and the reason is clear here. They, they went, uh, Heiser went and surveyed unvaccinated Americans. And unvaccinated Americans believe that the vaccine does not work. When you ask them, they think, oh, the number of people who get sick that are vaccinated is the same as the people that didn't get vaccinated. And they have a shorter life because the chance of side effects is huge. And they said the whole point of booster shots, well, that proves the vaccine doesn't work at all. So it's a total waste of time. They really believe this stuff. I guess because they watched Tucker Carlson and such misinformation. And then the travel rules, third COVID story I thought was interesting. Um, we now are letting people travel here if they're fully vaccinated, but we count people that got the Chinese vaccine as fully vaccinated, and that doesn't hardly work at all. And we don't count the Russian vaccine as fully vaccinated, which is, I think an illustrative of the same thing as your story, the pointless bureaucratic nonsense of American government caring only about what form you filled out and not the truth. Because the Russian vaccine, I think, works pretty well, but they didn't bother doing the tests and filling out the forms. And the Chinese vaccine has been proven to be almost useless, like 30% effective, even with three, like three doses. But they did fill out the forms. So uh, it's a shame. Anyway... 
Um, that's uh, three COVID stories that I thought were interesting. I don't, I'm still not understanding the, the rationale. And I've heard this before from people about well, how if you need a booster shot, that must mean it doesn't work. I don't, I don't understand that logic. I know. This is the, I mean, I, I'm, I've heard this, a job done well need never be done again. And then they say, well, how about mowing the lawn? You know, it's like, yeah. I mean, besides you have a different flu shot every year, not because it doesn't work, but because that's what you do. Yeah, it's not like you clean your house one time and then it's all done. So, I mean, I just don't understand. I don't understand this way of thinking. I know if I had to get another shot every month, I would do it. It beats dying. The other thing that I've heard is, well, because we wear, because we have to wear masks, that mean it does. That means it doesn't work. Well, it does mean it's not perfect. It doesn't completely eliminate all risk, take it all the way down to zero. But no drug ever has, no medical treatment ever has. But I mean, again, I'm not understanding the logic you use, like, you know, when you drive your car, you have just because you have analog brakes doesn't mean that wearing seatbelts isn't effective at reducing your risk of dying in an automobile accident. Well, you know, I was around in the 60s and 70s, and it was very much the same. The anti seatbelt people did have this same righteous indignation. You can't tell me what to do. It's perfectly fine. In fact, the big big thing they said then was the seatbelt just traps you in the car so you're burning the flaming wreckage. If you don't have the seatbelt on, then you can crawl out the window of your wreckage and you'll be fine. And then find some case where that happened and sure. say, there, that proves that the seatbelts do more harm than good. Just like the people that say, if I carry a gun everywhere, I'll be much safer. I'll just shoot everybody before they shoot me. And the statistics on that are similar. Anyway, it's anyway. So go down to your. You got the awesome one where the bird takes out the drone. So in a past story, I talked about how um, Amazon has been trying out their drone delivery, drone-based delivery service wing in uh, Australia, and they've been running it okay for the last couple of years, but they've run into a problem. Whereas the the uh, avian um, the avian life is not happy with these drones, and there is a really hilarious and awesome video of a raven attacking attacking a drone that's attempting to deliver a cup of coffee to someone, and uh, <laughs> it doesn't go well for the drone or the coffee. So they've had to pause this program until. Um, until the ornithologists figure out how these drones are affecting the birds and uh, what can they do to complete their mission without getting taken out by uh, ravens, raptors, and, and other things. And I think this is really cool. I had, I had read another story about where people have trained eagles to take out drones. Um, so, uh, I mean, this... I, I think there's a missed opportunity here. You know, we have drone battles in the arena. I mean, you could really spice it up a notch by adding a raptor versus drone segment to esports here. And could you train eagles to deliver coffee? Maybe so. I'm not sure, but that would be pretty cool if you if could. We could go all organic. Right. You know, they took dolphins and strapped uh, mines to them and used them to take down submarines and stuff. <laughs> there may be some, there may be some issues with this plan. Oh, yeah, there's always a few, that. there's always a few people that find bad things about things. <laughs> I'd rather have the drone run away from the bird than the drone fight the bird. Cause I was point, thinking the only thing you could do is put electrify the drone or give it a machine gun. Oh, I was I thinking a flamethrower. So you have instant chicken. Yeah, 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 I was gonna say you get you get you get lunch and a drink. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder about uh, camouflage. If there would be a way to camouflage the drones to make them less uh, birds can see through the water and go after them. Good luck with camouflage. Well, you know, considering you know hunters use like a fake duck, I assume you could make just make the drone look like something different to the eagle. Well, you could make it look like another bird, and then you'd really get the birds aren't real people going. <laughs> well, yeah, that would be great. Yeah, I could just see a lot of fun things coming out of this. Yeah.
But this, you know, I was talking to Caitlin about this just a couple of days ago. You know, they only deliver everything with drones, but how can you do that? You're going to have these things zipping by everywhere, ramming into each other, ramming into the power lines and the trees and everything. Isn't that, isn't that though what they said about cars? Well, that's why we have roads and cops and licenses and speed limits and stop signs. And you need all that before you have drones flying everywhere. They need right. to have like lanes and... Right. So what the, F, um, what the FAA is doing is they're actually cracking down on, on individuals who own drones. In fact, it's getting harder and harder to, to fly your own drone because they're gearing up to make the airways into essentially a bunch of highways for commercial drones. Well, that's what you should do, I think. I mean, there's um, people should be free to, you know, play around and fly their own drones. Well, I mean, that's just in, in a certain place, like a park or something. Well, you know, I wonder about uh, collision avoidance. I mean, there are there are ways to. I, I think there there might be some engineering solutions for this, possibly. But what if I want to crash two drones together? Well, then, it, then you well, go to the drone dem demolition derby. Well, you ought to be able to do that, but you ought to be like, just like you can't fly things near an airport, you you would need to stay away from the traffic lanes. Right. But the traffic lanes would pretty much be everywhere. So right. good luck with that. Yeah. Well, you'd set aside some some free speech area where you're allowed to fly your drone. Or, you know, I'll, uh, what, what about different altitudes, you know, yeah. like a certain, you know, I, I could see it as, as, you know, sort of the way that frequency, radio frequencies are set aside for certain purposes. Maybe you yeah. have certain altitudes that are, are set aside for commercial use and some that are available for civilian use or something like that. I think I saw it in Blade Runner or The Matrix or something where you have like 100 lanes of traffic going everywhere at all different heights and mm -hmm. look up in the sky. It's like, you know, madhouse. That's totally what downtown will be soon. Everybody flying drones everywhere. Yeah. And terrestrial delivery robots. Yeah. It'll be a paradise. Right, anyway. yeah. So so keep in mind, collision um, avoidance in the air is actually very difficult mm -hmm. um, because there's really no friction. Yep. Uh, you're, you're basically on ice and you can't just stop, you know, like you can in a car. Uh, once you start going in a certain direction, um, you know, avoiding or moving out of the way can be very difficult. The best thing that, that the drones can do is they can ascend or descend very quickly. But even then, it's, there's still some limits on that. Yeah. Besides, would... the cool thing is once you have proper amount of traffic, you'll dodge this one just to ram into the other one, you know. I was thinking some kind of positional, uh, some kind of uh, positional um, system that might be able to help mitigate the accidents. Well, well, you know, any way you cut it, those stupid birds are going to have to learn to stay in their lane and at the appointed speed, or none of this is going to work. <laughs> yeah. Well, what what they will probably end up doing is just probably taking a page from the way that airplanes work on um, instrument. Yeah. Yeah. Type flying where they right. essentially have you know like the vor uh signals coming out from uh right. points along essentially like virtual highways mm -hmm. um that the drones can then follow and not be reliant on like gps which can be spoofed and stuff and they'll have multiple ways of figuring out where to go but it will be essentially lanes that they can go into and start delivering stuff and, and i can we'll see hardly, how that goes i can hardly wait for the tesla drone that just rams into everything <laughs> And I mean, if you think about it, you know, we still we still drive on the highway, even though deer deer will run out in front of your car or into the side of it, which happened to me one time on an icy Michigan road. Oh, uh, that's always, better than the alternative. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right. And so uh, anyway, Caitlin's got the uh, right to repair issue. Yeah, so iPhone 13 has just come out. People are looking at it. They're going, ooh, ah, new iPhone, as always. Um, except that there's a little problem. Uh, some repair people have decided to try to repair the iPhone 13. So they bought two iPhone 13s. They took the screen off one, and they replaced it with the screen from the other. And suddenly, the face ID does not work. Now, I know what you're thinking. OK, maybe that phone is tied to the Face ID hardware in the screen. Well, there's a problem with that. The Face ID hardware is not in the screen. It is actually on the device itself. Uh, so uh, it, this appears to be a deliberate action on Apple's part 
to make it much more difficult to repay your fund, basically make it unusable if you don't go through Apple. And we've been saying unfair, you know, monopolistic practices, targeting uh, repair shops. Um, and this is a great example of that, where, where Apple has this great monopolistic market. They don't like people, you know, going through cheaper repair services. So they intentionally design their hardware to essentially break or become unusable if you use, if you do a very simple DIY job yourself to repair your phone. So did they actually add an extra component just to put a serial number on the screen? Yes, that could apparently. Be that is pretty egregious. <laughs> yeah, and this has been going on with Apple for a long time and a lot of other companies too, um, coffee makers. Uh, <laughs> all that means is you, when you change the screen, you have to remove the RFID tag from the old screen and put it on the new screen or reprogram it or something. Or something. I mean, there, there, are, there are chips uh, known as ROM, Sam, uh, where you can write once. Yeah. And, and then good luck. <laughs> <laughs> after that and plus the the problem especially with the phone components is that they are so small yeah. like they're smaller than most the electronic components you've ever used yeah. and yeah. sometimes just desoldering it requires not just a regular soldering iron not just a heat gun but like a ten thousand um, uh, dollar you know machine specifically for doing the you know bga type type soldering so yeah yeah well if you pass a right to repair law, that would be the end of this nonsense. Good luck with that. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> okay. And Irvin, but Apple doesn't want to. No. That's Apple right. Apple does not want to. And Irvin seems to have suggesting that there's something wrong with VPNs. Uh, there might be something wrong with VPNs. So this this specific VPN called Liquid VPN uh, used to market that, hey, you can get to your favorite movies and stuff through us. We're not gonna keep a log of it and you are free to jump wherever you want, to watch whatever you want. Well, as usual, film studios decided we're bored. We're gonna go hit somebody. So they went after them, they sued them um, and Liquid VPN's lawyers did not show up to court. So now the, the film folks are moving to default judgment uh, this is going to start hitting everybody, all the VPNs who say we don't we don't keep logs. Hmm. This is going to have a, a ripple effect now. Well, I, I thought the whole point of ones that say they don't keep logs is they also better not be in America. These guys are in America, I guess. Who knows where they were? I think yeah. they might have been American. Well, if they're not American, then they can just laugh at American lawsuits, I think. Yeah, well, they're getting sued. And they're yeah. probably going to lose because they didn't show up. And um, and I think this is going to affect everybody else. Everybody who says we don't keep uh, track of you. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. We, we're going to find out. I mean, the, I know in other countries, there are actually rules where you must keep records like Britain, I think, but not America. All right. All right. Well, for now. Yeah, for now. Yeah. But they've been trying every year to make the internet equal to a telephone and you must provide law enforcement access and they've never managed yet. Mm -hmm. Anyway, all right. And Alan has got HTTPS. HTTPS and the EFF, which has for many years now provided a plugin called or browser extension called HTTPS Everywhere, which forced uh, many different mainstream browsers to use HTTPS when given a choice between HTTPS and HTTP. And so this has been really a standard extension for the security conscious for about a decade now. And the EFF is, as of a few days ago, going to phase out their support of this extension because as they say, it's no longer necessary. So this is good news. First of all, uh, most websites now use HTTPS and uh, the mainstream browsers uh, give you an option within their own settings to force HTTPS. So really there's no need for this additional extension any longer. So it's just a sign of the times and it's a good sign of the times. Uh, not only is HTTPS adoption widespread, but the browsers uh, pretty much allow you to um, enforce it without the need of an extension. Yeah, yeah. I, I just yesterday or a couple of days ago, I was trying to make a uh, project for a client 
and I needed to send some unencrypted data. And it was actually really hard to find any site that lets you send unencrypted data. <laughs> There's a few of them out there. The only one I found that was handy was an Acunetics deliberately vulnerable website. But <laughs> anyway, that's, yeah, I, that's good. All right. And so anyway, this one got my attention. I guess it came from Yahoo News. The CIA really wanted to kill Julian Assange. This was Mike Pompeo. And um, they, he, that's why he made this statement. I remember hitting the press at the time that WikiLeaks was a non-state hostile intelligence agency. And the point was that made it equal legally to a terrorist organization, essentially. And therefore, it was legal to ex to use the military to go after them. And they, when they that they were afraid of, they had intelligence that the Russians. See, Julian Assange was hiding out in the Ecuadorian embassy, and the Ecuadorians were planning to sneak him out. They were going to declare him a ambassador or something, and then it would be legal to let him leave the country, and then he could go to Russia, like um, Snowden. And the American intelligence agency really felt like that would be an embarrassment to America. They didn't want to let that happen. And so they actually called up the British people and said, how about we like just um, if he tries to leave, we'll just shoot the tires out of his vehicle and like kill him and blow up the we'll have guys have a gun battle on the streets of London fighting over him. Or if he tries to get on a plane, we'll shoot the wheels out of the plane or we'll have a helicopter in the way or we'll just ram the car with another car. And the police, the spies in London said, if you're going to do that stuff, we're going to do it. We don't need you Americans driving around doing that stuff. And they really discussed this seriously and eventually decided not to do it. But um, this, the fact that this has come out, in fact, another thing they discussed at the time was, gee, you know, if we talk like this and this gets out, it's going to follow up the legal case. It'll either leak out from some kind of whistleblower or it'll get to the press. And if that happens, we'll never be able to convict him of anything. And that's exactly what's happened. This has hit the press and his defense lawyers in Britain, where he is, are saying, well, you can't extradite him. Those savage Americans, look what savages they are. They'll just kill him. So he might get off because of this hitting the press. But anyway, it's uh, it's very interesting. I mean, he was a big, important guy. Um and another thing, which is I thought was an interesting take on this, is these drastic moves and these drastic considerations, in fact, worked. WikiLeaks has, was destroyed. It's no longer of any importance. They were real important, like 10 years ago, leaking out the DNC cables, which they totally got from Russia by asking Russia for it, and then fingered an innocent guy, uh, Seth Rich, who didn't do it to try to make it seem like he was the source. I mean, they're, they're a pretty nasty group. Describing them as a non-state hostile actor is not entirely unreasonable. But anyway, um, it's I always wondered how anybody was going to prosecute Julian Assange. And he'd been held for years in various forms of effective confinement with very unclear legal reasons for that. <laughs> anyway, uh, and he still continues to be held with very vague, unclear charges as to whether he really should be, in fact, held. Anyway... Off it goes. And then Liz has got uh, Elizabeth Holmes, another controversial character. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I thought this was just kind of an interesting story on the, the ongoing saga over uh, Theranos. And um, I don't know, this, this just kind of hit home for me because it reminds me of it reminds me of a situation that I've I've ended up I've ended up in myself sort of uh, in in certain scenarios. So um, essentially, this article discusses. Uh, it's entitled "How Elizabeth Holmes Sidelined the Real Scientists at Theranos," and um, essentially, what happened was these scientists were saying, "Hey." This lab equipment is giving results that are way off. We, you know, we we've run this test, and and I, you know, we found out that, you know, two thirds of the test samples tested out of range, and we know that's a problem, especially because we ran the tests on other machines. And they were within the normal range. And then we sent the samples to other labs and they were again in the normal range. We know these are bad 
tests. We know these machines are unreliable. And um, like many uh, delusional folks in management, they are not out to actually improve their product or get to the root cause of problems. What they are into is confirmation bias. So any uh, information that conflicts with that, they don't want to hear it. And um, they got to the point where uh, Elizabeth would um, send out e emails about the stuff and then cut the scientists out of the email chains. <laughs> so Which I think it's very common that they just cut out all the testy technical people so the salespeople can just tell lies yeah. to the customer without yeah. that irritating noise. Yeah. And, you know, especially when it comes to medical care, you know, some of these scientists are like, hey, you really need to. Uh, really need to pay attention to this because, you know, there are patients who are uh, being diagnosed, prescribed medications, what have you, based on these results, you know, maybe we should let the doctors know there's a problem here. And they weren't having it. Um, you know, they, they, at all costs, we have to protect the corporate image. So, um, uh, you know, at, at the truth, the thing is, the truth always comes out in the end. And it came out in the end here. Yeah, well, that would be nice. So uh, you know, I I think that I think that uh, <laughs> at some point you got to listen to your scientists and your engineers because had they done so earlier, I think they could have avoided a lot of the trouble that they ended up in. Uh, yes, I was just thinking about your statement, the truth comes out in the end. I heard a discussion yesterday where they said um, the future uh, future historians will not look kindly on the Republicans that just stood by idly and let Trump turn this judge into a dictatorship. And the other guy said, well, you know, the history is written by the victors. The truth might not come out. <laughs> anyway, uh, but in, in, in the technocratic world, you'd like to think the truth would come out. Anyway, all right, and Caitlin has got AT&T, the, the, the happy place. Yes, the, the great company, AT&T, which everybody loves, apparently is having some problems. Uh, so uh, Chris uh, uh, Matizic uh, over at ZDNet uh, has this article talking about how AT&T has big problems. And basically what this guy did, and this is the most AT&T thing ever. So... Uh, Chris went to an AT&T store and then a T-Mobile store because he was interested in some of the new uh, flip phones, smartphones, you know, the ones with the folding screens that are actually really cool. Uh, so anyway, uh, he goes to an AT&T store and this is the most AT&T thing ever. So there's only like two people in the store and he goes up to the AT&T rep. The AT&T rep says, uh, give me your name. Uh, he says, oh, it's Chris. And then the AT&T rep says it'll be a 30 minute wait. The at t rep doesn't ask why he's there, doesn't ask, you know, what's going on, just 30 minute wait, you better deal with it. Um, anyway, so Chris looked at the phones, um, you know, got a good look at, at what he was looking for, and then looked at his watch and realized there's 28 more minutes left until he could speak to somebody, so he just left. Uh, <laughs> So then he goes to the at t the, sorry, he goes to the T-Mobile store, which is apparently very close by. And immediately the customer service person sits down with him and says, hey, what's up? What, what are you looking for? And he's like, oh, I'm speaking to someone. Well, this is nice. And, uh, and he starts asking him questions like, which phone do you like? And, and the, the salesperson was very honest. He says, you know, well, the Fold you know, still has issues with app developers not developing for test aspect ratio. So, you know, go with the flip if you want that, you know. Um, and then he asks them another question, like, well, I get good service at my house. And uh, the T-Mobile representative pulled up a map and said, well, let's look at where the nearest cell phone tower is. Oh, well, it's actually kind of far away. So actually, no, you're going to get kind of iffy signals at your house. Like, like they were honest. And he's like, whoa, you're honest. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, anyway, then uh, he, he had a great time. He talked to the person at the desk and, and everything, and then left and then realized that if he were still at the AT&T store, he still wouldn't have even talked to anyone else. <laughs> so I thought this was the perfect illustration of why AT&T is just uh, can't even. 
Yeah, yeah. I remember when when I like I never used to pay attention to businesses. And then like 20 years ago, I had an experience where I walked in a store and someone immediately came up to me and helped me politely. And I realized how hard that is to do, you know. You really have to respect people who will like you, you do. You have to respect them. You have to ex- respect their intelligence. In fact, uh, one of, a long time ago, I moved away from AT and T to Sonic, and I'm perfectly willing to plug them. They're a local ISP, uh, born from a community college, so it's like plugging PBS kind of, even though it's a private business. But anyway, yeah. uh, so I'm, I'm willing to pl- <laughs> plug them. But um, but one of the things that brought me to their business is, unlike every other ISP, they have a wiki. And you can click on a page on their wiki and it has all the, their DNS settings, all their mail settings. <laughs> like, like, I've never seen another um, company just like treat their customers with this amount of respect. <laughs> I've heard a lot of good things about Sonic. Yeah. All right. Anyway, and I haven't heard very many good things about AT&T actually. So. You know, AT- yeah, AT and T and their their bad rep goes back decades. I've heard people complaining about them for for my entire life, and, it, and it's true. And they've only pretty much they haven't improved. They this is not something that's going to get better. No, I don't think so. All right, and Irvin has got a smart toilet because why not? <laughs> uh, apparently, the smart toilet is coming in the future where it can tell you if you are healthy or not, or if you need to eat something or stop eating certain things. Yeah. Kind of stuff. Well, you know, I was reading this article. I was thinking this sounds pretty good. You know, in Germany, the toilets are specially designed with a shelf so you can examine what comes out before it goes down to assess your health. This is a common belief there that you should be examining your waste to make, to see if you are healthy. So and by the way, I know they're doing COVID testing this way. They test the sewer lines and they can tell how many people have COVID. So I actually think this is pretty brilliant. <laughs> this probably would be as effective or more effective than those things people wear to measure their heart rate and everything to monitor yeah. your health. Um, especially since I think most American health problems are caused by poor diet. This would be a, I don't know, I'm, I'm pretty much for it. <laughs> this could be an interesting uh, development. Yeah, I may be one of the first customers. I don't know. I'm buying it anyway. Cool, cool. Of course, then it'll get hacked and stuff. But anyway. Of course. Of course it will. <laughs> it has right. to. That's just the natural progression of things. Yes, it is. Like, like birds going after drones. That's right. That's right. All right. And Alan has got uh, Google. And an excerpt from a book that's been published in Fast Company. Uh, Noah Gian Siracusa, who is an assistant professor of mathematical sciences at Bentley University in Boston, has published a book. Um, and in it, he, he talks about Vinton Cerf's uh, uh, testimony to the UK Parliament in June of 2020. So this is going back over a year. It's not exactly news or current news. But it's illuminating in its own way. Uh, Vince Cert, of course, is oftentimes called the father of the internet, among other superlatives. Uh, and he was one of the uh, sci- lead scientists in developing um, a number of the internet protocols way back in the day, the 1970s. So he is an important figure. And in part because of that, he also now has a position at Google as a vice president and chief internet evangelist whatever that means. Um, And in his testimony to the UK Parliament, he was uh, asked about the quality of search results that Google was returning. And he said some interesting things about this. Again, this is not exactly new news, but it's news to me and it's rather illuminating. He said, Surf did, that um, Google does not rely on algorithms alone. It also relies on 10,000 people looking at websites and these 10,000 people's evaluations of these websites are then used to inform uh, how Google um, uh, ranks page results. And these 10,000 people are not actually Google employees they are contractors and they work for a third party. Um, And nevertheless, 
and they're not paid very well either. It seems that many of them are Americans actually, but they're only paid $13 and 50 cents. And they have to follow a 138 page, uh, uh, or rather 168 page document that uh, lays out how one is supposed to evaluate a website. At any rate, these 10,000 people who are toiling away, um, their evaluations then uh, are used to inform the machine learning algorithms or whatever it is that Google uses. And it turns out that Google is tweaking their algorithms constantly. Uh, in the year 2018, over 3,000 times Google tweaked its search algorithms. So this is almost like what uh, Ask Jeeves was doing way back in the day, almost 20 years ago, in which they had a, a different algorithm for every different search, practically. Uh, Google's almost doing the same thing, just on a more efficient and larger scale. Um, now, one question that the uh, UK Parliament asked of uh, Surf was, uh, in particular, um, in response to a search that um, apparently at one point you, you, you uh, performed a certain search on Google and Google will tell you that Muslims in the UK do not pay taxes, uh, which of course is a total falsehood. But uh, Surf answered that, admitted essentially that Google's algorithms are brittle and that uh, there's not much that can be done about such things, that they are inevitable, that uh, of course they will be refined, but um, there will always be problems like that. There will always be errors. Math is brittle, I knew it. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I know Facebook is undergoing the same examination and they have a similar process. They have this complicated algorithm to decide what to show you. But I know Facebook's latest improvement is they're pushing articles which are propaganda about how Facebook is good to try to improve their image. And they've got the platform on which to do it and to get the, the necessary traction. And Google could do that too. <laughs> yeah, maybe this is why I hadn't heard of this. That's true. <laughs> All right. All right. And uh, so anyway, this one I thought was interesting. The United States Cold War with China is heating up. So now not only is U.S government services is not allowed to use Huawei stuff or ZTE stuff from China. They now have a program. You can apply for a grant and they will pay your company what it costs to replace all the H Huawei and ZTE gear you have at your company. So they're trying to basically drive this, all this equipment out of America. And, you know, I don't think they're doing this for no reason. <laughs> uh, they're concerned that there's backdoors in that stuff. So anyway, I'm, I was surprised to see that. So every, I wonder if there will come a time when they actually outlaw the use of this stuff in America. But they're trying, they're moving every step forward to try to get rid of it. Anyway, um, and Liz has ad blockers. Yeah, so I thought this was kind of interesting. The story um, showed up in a uh, motherboard uh, for Vice, um, which talked about how um the various you know three letter agencies in the in the US intelligence community have been aggressively applying um ad blockers uh because uh they have become conscious of um of how uh how uh malicious it can be um and uh so i mean they're they're using i mean it sounds like when they said uh the the intelligence community has implemented network-based ad blocking technologies and uses information from uh several layers i was thinking uh I was thinking, wow, it sounds like they've um, deployed a bunch of uh, massive pie holes um, <laughs> at the federal offices. Uh, and um, I mean, it makes sense because uh, there is a bunch there. It's gotten a lot worse even than the last five to 10 years as far as um, 
the way that data tracking and collection uh, works through uh, advertising. I did a little bit of research on this for one of my uh, grad school projects that was kind of interesting and enlightening in terms of the way that they have really ramped up the game on this. And I mean, the fact that it's easy to um, uh, actually deploy some some pretty nasty little tools um, via some of these uh, um, some of these uh, uh, advertising um, vectors. And uh, one thing that was interesting to me was that I learned a new term from this article uh, called uh, bidstream data. And I, I had never heard that term before, but it makes a whole lot of sense because um, it talks about the way that uh, uh, companies gather data on people and entities, um, uh, and, and which, which is known as this, this bid, bid stream data through um, a system where uh, data brokers can um, Basically, they're they're um, they're they're uh, conducting real time bidding on um, on advertisement placement. So um, they're uh, they're like for examples. Let's just say that you're on. Um, let's just say that you're using Twitch and you've got a uh, or or maybe that's a bad that's a bad uh, example. Let's say you're watching YouTube and. Um, uh, you're going to be advertised, um, you know, they're going to, they want to advertise uh, ham radio equipment to Caitlin. Well, um, they can uh, actually uh, <laughs> basically get into a person's browsing session. They can say, oh, well, she's watching um, these videos on YouTube. Um, let's bid for our ad placement to come up for her. And um, so they do, but they've also collected data on her on what she's watching and what she's doing within her browser session as part of this bid process. And um, you can really assemble a lot of information on a, a person or an entity based on the information that's collected throughout this, this bid stream data brokering process. So um, it's, it's uh, become a real, uh, it's become a real issue for, um, uh, uh, cybersecurity defense folks, because um, it can it can cause problems both uh, for you know sensitive intelligence um, issues and um, also just I mean above and beyond the the basic uh, privacy problems. Mm -hmm. So something something to pay attention to. Something pretty interesting, I think. Yeah, yeah. So we should all use ad blockers. Yes. All right. And Caitlin has got the one I liked best, copy and pasting the brain. Yes, good news, everybody. Samsung wants to copy and paste human brains onto neuromorphic chips. Huzzah! This is, this is the future. <laughs> we were all promised. This is exactly what Kurzweil is taking all the vitamins for. He yes. thought that by taking enough vitamins and exercise and stuff, he can live long enough to live forever. They'll copy your brain onto a positronic brain and you'll just live forever. Yes, yes. So, well, actually, that's that. It doesn't sound like that level of, of coolness is happening. Basically, Sam, this is a so this is from Samsung's newsroom. So, this is a press release. Take this with a grain of salt. Uh, but what they want to do is they want to copy and paste neural links uh, or neural networks within the human brain um, onto, a, onto a silicon, essentially. And just in order to improve efficiency and sort of understand how the human brain works and stuff like that, not actually like copying personalities and copying your brain into a, a disembodied state on a motherboard, uh, it, they just basically want to improve computing power. Um, and the, the big problem has always been just size. Uh, so the human brain has about 100 billion neurons. Um, and so the chip would require at least um, uh, 100 trillion uh, memories to go along with that, essentially. Uh, but Samsung is now saying, hey, we have the ability to do that now with our 3D integration technology. So let's do it. Of course. What could go wrong? It'll what could possible. possibly go wrong? Well, we'll have totally have like, you know, brains alive in a jar, plotting things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is 
this is the future, apparently. This is the way Let's God intended. This is yeah. what I've been waiting for ever since I saw the Terminator and everything, you know? Yep, we're about, we're, we're only five years away from Judgment Day, everyone. So good news. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right. They had an official date, right? Actually, that movie was set in the 90s. Yeah, yeah. The date has, has long since passed, and then they keep moving it out every <laughs> every five years. And now, yeah. yeah just it's, like always, every, it's always five years away. Just like every other doomsday cult, like the Jehovah's Witnesses. They predict the end of the world every couple of years, and then when it doesn't happen, they just predict it again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's um, well, well, what happens is that, of course, Sarah Connor stops the doomsday oh. from happening but ends up only delaying it five years. So then a Terminator comes back in time and they and Sarah Connor delay it for another five years. And then somehow John Connor uh, delays it another five years until Terminators go back in time and kill John Connor, but then accidentally delay it another five years by doing that. You know, it's, sounds it's, great. You know we're how not, time travel goes. Well, we're living through a similar thing right now. They keep predicting Trump will be reinstated like in July, no, in August, no, in September. But yes, Mike Lindell just yesterday said uh, uh, Trump will be in office on Thanksgiving. He's going to be having Thanksgiving in the White House. <laughs> That's right. We'll see. Yeah. We'll see. Well, the other thing a lot of them are saying now, which I think, I'm not sure it's Lindell, they say that Biden was never in the White House at all. It's all just like a Zoom background. He's just pretending to be in the White House. Oh, that's... Hey. That's terrible. I just, they that faked liar. It. <laughs> they faked it like the moon landing, you know. So, all right, anyway, so, and Irvin has got the signal jammer. Uh, oh, this is fun. So, uh, somebody's house got broken into. Pardon me, that my, my mute was not on. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, they have a video for whatever reason. Yeah. So, so, somebody broke into a house and stole some stuff. Uh, first, the, the people in the house thought, hey, maybe we left the door open by accident. But then when they looked around, they realized, oh, they did get burglarized. When they when they did the usual thing of let me check out my nest camera to see what happened they noticed somebody flashing uh, uh using the flashlight to see if there's a camera there and then there's some gaps in the video eight yeah so uh they called the the homeowners called ring to say hey what happened and they said well there's nothing wrong with the the camera itself but it did lose Wi-Fi. So, hey, if you have a tool that does deauthentication, Which would be easy to do. Which would be easy to do. And they're cheap and they're small. And they're very quite, they're quite portable. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, not, not, not to point in any direction. Does, does, any, your, does, any, your, does that thing you got there do that, Caitlin? Yeah. That's exactly what the article mentioned. I saw Irvin's article and I read it. And they actually talked about this exact watch they have. <laughs> yep. That that essentially it's they they call it um jamming, but essentially what they're talking about is this de -offing. Yep. You know, they're, they're just trying to put it in layman's terms. Uh so they're talking about a watch that does this sort of de -offing for like 50 bucks. This is the watch. <laughs> yeah, you can yes. go on Amazon, get a get a watch that uh de -offs Wi-Fi. Now, the thing that I find really interesting is that this watch actually only works on 2.4 gigahertz. You can get, you know, your laptop out and a, you know, a USB dongle to work on 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, but this little watch only works on 2.4. And I don't know what ring is connecting to on what band, um, but if they switch to 5 gigahertz, they would completely <laughs> break the watch. The watch wouldn't do anything. So, I yeah. Don't know. Well, you know, my, um, well, the watch doesn't need Wi Fi, does it? No, the watch the watch works. The watch deauths on two point four gigahertz because it has why a does, ESP. Why couldn't, it, why couldn't it deauth on five? Because it it runs on a microcontroller called an ESP um, uh, eighty eight something. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but it, it only works on two point four gigahertz. Just yeah. that's the microcontroller. But you totally could make a jammer for two point for five, right? You, oh, you could, you could. But yeah. the article mentions the. Yeah. Yeah, the article mentions the watch. Yeah, yeah, but you know the um. You know, Cisco access points do this. Happened to me when I tried to teach a class. They have rogue access point suppression, they call it. You turn it on and it deauths everything it doesn't like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's true. So basically, your surveillance devices should not be wireless. No, they shouldn't. They should be wired. Yeah, that would be a lot better. Okay. That would be a lot better. Now, are people going to do that? That's a different question. Well, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. 
All right. Well, that's it for this one. And it being Tuesday, we'll be back on Friday. And as usual, I can't find the button. Wait, we're going to be, it's Tuesday? We're going to be back on Friday, Sam? Yes, it's Tuesday. You're messing with me. (laughs) That's really cool.